In this video, we're going to do a, an inspection of the parts of the LT85 gearbox. Now we've got it stripped down, and you saw in the previous video that I'll put a link up where I'm all, I'm up here somewhere. I don't know. Anyway, I'm going to put a link into the video of, of taking it apart. I made a few mistakes. Don't worry, I, I, we all make mistakes. But as again, what we found out was the book didn't cover the split case gearbox. It co covers a solid case. Now this had me really wondering when I was taking it apart because. I'm looking through the online catalogue for Land Rover parts and it says, you know, about buying an oil pump. I never even saw an oil pump and I'm sort of looking all over for it. And it was only on certain models. And even then, on the solid case models, they even had a, a, an oil filter that went in the side of the casing. And I'm sort of looking around and the rebuild kits include filters and oil pumps. And I'm thinking, where the hell, where the hell did they go? So anyway, so it's a, this gearbox is a bit of a mystery. It's strong, I must admit, it's nice and strong. Uh, I think it's pretty well made. It's a lot better than the LTs, that's for sure. Um, some people say it's not as strong as, as what? As a solid case box? You know, what are you going to do with your, <laughs> what are you going to do with your Land Rover? Are you going to pull dump trucks with it? I don't know, because otherwise... If you're using it for day-to-day -day use, a bit of towing and carrying heavy things, it's going to be fine. I mean, a lot of people in the Land Rover world want vehicles that are going to tow 70 tonnes or something ridiculous like that. It's, it's absolutely ludicrous. And, and the same with saying, oh, well, I want to put a lot of weight in the back of my truck and I want to carry a lot of weight. Well, I can't put a pallet of 1.5 tonnes in the back of my 130 without it tipping up in the air. So although it will pull it, it's the most dangerous thing you've ever driven. So that's a no-no. Put everything on a trailer. So, what have we got in this gearbox and what are we supposed to be looking at? Well, the first thing that jumps out to you is looking at the main shaft. The main shaft splines on here are beautiful. They're really nice. And this is the thing that goes straight away. So I'm just going to pause this video now and I'm going to show you what is a, a shaft that's on its way out. This shaft here, I don't know if you can focus in on that, this shaft here is out of an R380 and I hope you can see that there's a distinctive difference in the bottom of the spline to this top of the spline. Can you see that? I'm going to try and do this, upload this video in HD, so I'll try and keep it short today. But it's because the gear that went in the transfer box didn't have any lubrication, so the gear just chattered on the end. So I think with this one here, somebody's had that problem before and changed the shaft. So that's a good thing. And I'm looking at the shaft and these are all the bearing surfaces here. And they're all nice and smooth. You know, like they say in um, the manuals, you check them with a the micrometer. You know, usually if it looks good, it is good. And when we were apprentices and fitters and things like this, because that's what fitters do. They take, you know, somebody will give you a great big box of bits and they say, well, put that back together and any bits that are not there, you have to make them. So you have to logically work out how to put things back together or make things. Um, but what we were taught to do is use your fingernails for scratching uh, on the surface. And it actually is an engineering uh, standard, is a scratch test. You run your fingers across and you can feel any imperfections in shafts. So I, I, this is perfect. And, I, you know, sometimes... Like they say, if it looks right, then it is right. And uh, I, I can't see anything at fault with that shaft. It looks uh, pretty good. Um, so I obviously think that's been done maybe 10,000 10, miles, 15,000 miles. I really don't know. So that's good. We're happy with that. The next, the first motion shaft. 
Um, again, we've got to check the bearings. We've got to check the bearing in here is a nice snug fit on. Oops. Go. Got to make sure it's a nice fit on there. I'm going to replace the synchro rings, but as I mentioned in the video before, oops, there goes the bearing. You've got to make sure that the gap in here is within tolerances. Uh, you'll get all that information in the, the workshop manual because that's pretty much universal. A rule of thumb is 25 thou. Now, I have had in the past some jobber um, synchro rings. Don't know where they came from, probably China or India or somewhere like that. And the gap was too big. What happens there, in that instance, is when you put your gearbox together, all those little bits and pieces get bigger and bigger. And then they, when you put the end covers on, the gearbox is too tight. Well, it won't turn. So you have to work backwards and find out what the problem is. Because you would have thought, the bigger the gap, the longer it's going to last. But... It isn't really the case. So just check the tolerances on that with the workshop manual. The bearings. These are roller bearings, ball, ball bearings. Um, there always is a little bit of play in them once they get a little bit worn. I'm not going to replace them. I'm not going to replace any bearings on this. Sometimes people go a bit wild and change absolutely everything. But if you check things out, and you... You listen to them, you know, that's without any lubrication, that's been washed. Um, I think they're all going to be fine. You, you want to have a look inside the races, see if there's any chips, in all, all both sides, inside and out. But never get your, wash them off, and then get your air gun and spin them round. It does make a funny noise and it's kind of gyroscopic and things like that. You only do that with bearings that you know that you're never going to put back on because being dry, it can damage the inside of the races. So although it's fun, don't do it. The other thing we've got to check is the gears themselves. We're going to check all the teeth to make sure there's no damaging, no pits, um, there's no sharp edges. We're going to put... The needle roller bearings on the bear, on the gear and check them on the shaft to make sure they're not loose. But believe me, on this gearbox I've struck lucky. Um, it's okay. When you run your hand across the top of the teeth on the synchro, you'll find they're a little bit sharp. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get a stone, like a stone sharp, uh, a knife sharpening stone, and run it across the top and just to take that little bit of sharpness off. Now, whilst we're on the subject of this, of the gears, what you're looking for in the, uh, the gears themselves, this, uh, in this, these teeth here, they, they have to look almost a little bit like a coffin with a pointy top, because, I don't know if you can see very well, they're, they're actually tapered. Let me see if I can get a pen... And I can draw this for you on the bench. So when you look down on the, the profile of the teeth, which would be like this, that's what they've got to look like. And the reason is, when your synchro hub comes into play, this piece, wait a minute, I don't want to pop that out if I can help it. Um, when this piece comes in, uh, it has to lock. I bet these are going to go all over the place. If you can see inside this synchro hub here, if you can see that, let me turn it around a little bit. The insides of that hub are shaped sort of like this. Um, there's one tooth. Not very good at art, that's why I got thrown out of art school. Like it, but. Um, <clears throat> oops. Anyway, look, that piece is supposed to lock into here, so that piece locks into there. Um, and, it, and it really stops it jumping out of gear. And if it, it, I hope you can understand that because it's really difficult to explain. I mean, if you were here, I could show you. But um, 
So the insides of the synchros lock into that. They're not parallel. So if these are all rounded, and if these bits are all chipped and broken, it's going to jump out of gear. See? That's how they jump out of gear. The synchros have won because you've been grinding the gears backwards and forwards. These bits have been worn out. So these bits are now irrelevant. And as I said to you the other day, these act like a brake to stop the... This, this piece turning and locking into the other piece, into the synchro hub. So, that's one of the problems that you have with gears, and that's what you've got to look at every, every little bits and pieces. So, um, that's, that's basically how a gearbox works, and they're all the same. It doesn't matter where you come from, they're all the same apart from an automatic. So, next thing. I hope you got that, because I, even I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I do really, but... We'll look at the lay shaft. The lay shaft has um, a roller bearing, a, par you know, a, t uh, a parallel roller bearing on the front, and a really funky design on the back. Uh, it's like a double row thrust bearing. And the reason for that is... You see the shape of the helical gears. These are called helical gears. The thrust will go this way. All right. The thrust is going towards the back of the gearbox. So it's actually trying to screw its way out of the box. Now this is what's called a straight cut gear. And that's why when you put your car in reverse, it's always noisier than it is going forwards. Now this didn't happen with the 300 TDIs. It was a completely different thing. Or the R380s and LT uh, the R380 did it differently. The LT77 had this idea, and same as the old series trucks, they had that same idea as well. So what we're going to look for is any, again, any chips in the teeth, anything at all. Uh, make sure the bearings are nice and tight. As you can see, I just used a bit of plastic pipe fitting to keep that together whilst we're fitting it. Uh, but that allows a little bit of free movement. So, and there's a shim that goes at the front end. So, hopefully, whoever did it before has shimmed it up correctly. Next thing. One of the things I found out the other day, when I came back to this last night, I was kind of puzzled about the fifth gear. No, it's not a program on Channel 4 about cars, but... When I took this out, I noticed this was pretty, uh, pretty beaten up. And when I looked through the uh, parts manual, there's supposed to be a pin that fits in here, which is about 3 or 5 millimetres, depending on the model of the gearbox. You always have to work off the suffix of the gearbox. So what happens is, this piece goes on here, and the pin goes through this hole, if you can see the hole just about there, see the hole? So the pin goes through there, but on the back side of the gearbox, when this was all a bit dirty, I couldn't see where it's going. So this bit had been turning, consequently, that's why this has all got worn out, both sides. So where's the pin? Well, it wasn't in the gearbox, that's for sure. It's there, look. Can you see? See how it's snapped off? I've got to try and get that out some, somehow. Uh, the, pin, the pin's actually sheared off for some reason and caused all that damage. Now, I don't really want to buy a new gear just for that. Uh, and to drill that out is going to be tricky if that's, hard, if that's a hardened pin. So, oh, I thought somebody was coming in. So that's my job for today, to get that out. So we'll, we'll repair that, and this here just needs to put it in a lathe, we'll put that in a lathe and we'll, we'll buff this up and clean it all up. That's where the oil seals run, uh, but between the transfer case, between the transfer case and the gearbox, obviously it's got rusty at some time, but the, the actual surface where the, the oil seals run on are quite good. So sometimes you can salvage parts, but again, that's that, just that one part alone... I think, I, I think it was priced at about £50, which was kind of expensive. And I haven't got any spares. What else have we got to look at? The slippers. Yeah. yeah, let's have a look at these. 
again these are replaceable they're pretty cheap this is on the fifth gear um, you want to look for signs of wear on the sides uh, not so much on this bit but they are cheap and they're, they're quite re easily to re be replaced if you have a let me see let me see if I can assemble this on this synchro what they do is they sit in the synchro synchronizer unit or the hub and they allow the, the, the gears to be changed and that's what they do they go around like this all the time and if you've got any loose or play it, it upwards or downwards in this piece here then it's going to make for really bad gear changes as well so there's one to look for on that piece the same thing goes for the the forks for the gears now this one is for the uh, first and second uh, for, third and fourth gears and we maybe take we've got, I've lost all my shims now but this fits in here and there is a tolerance that's in the book that will tell you what the space between that is but if it if this fork here is worn out both sides it never really wears in the middle but it wears this side and this side wait a minute let's come down here it wears on this side and this side uh, if they're worn out it's a new fork next thing what else can we tell you about oh the casings that's right just a minute Well, I cleaned up the casings yesterday and I give them a good inspection to see if they're going to be okay. These are, these are fine to use. One thing I wanted to say was that somebody's used a lot of silicone on this before. And I don't really like silicone. I'm not a great lover of it. But on these faces here, you know, we've got no choice. But you can still see, even though I've cleaned it up, there's uh, little bits of silicone inside it's terrible stuff it's good stuff but at the same time it's terrible stuff to clean clean off uh, you can see there look I've got a little bit out and that can get trapped into all sorts of places so clean it all out now if you want a top tip how to get silicone off you soak it in gasoline or petrol and it makes it all go mushy and then it comes off really easy so that's that's a top tip because sometimes silicone you can spend hours with a scraper and you know you're gouging everything away just put everything in a bucket of petrol and everything will come off um, cleaning out the uh, airways and uh, not the airways but the screw holes and things this is a super little uh, blowgun it hasn't got a very big end on it but it goes right deep into the apertures and it allows that to either dry out if it's got moisture in it or um, uh, cleaning fluid blow it out if there's any sand if you've sandblasted anything like I occasionally do blow out the sand and take the time even on things like these blind hole, these holes here that hold the uh, the high and low shifter or the diff lock sh shifter on blow them all out just spend the time to just clean everything you know because um, it will come back and bite you in the bum if something if you've got, got a little bit of sand if you've sandblasted your casings it'll come back and get you um, yeah clean all the thread clean all the threads um, like I said just run the airline around everything make sure it's all nice and clean um, one thing I wanted to mention was and this was I was thinking about that this morning when you've got a casing like this and you just use silicone instead of gaskets the engineers who designed this, uh, these casings well probably in the early 80s they didn't have fancy silicones like we have today and they would have just used gaskets because that's all there was available however uh, when you come to modern gearboxes well I say modern gearboxes say for example the R380 that didn't have any gaskets in it at all it was all done with like a, a silicone based sealer and it was very good but what I was going to say to you is this say for example we this was all siliconed up together we've got our shafts in and then we're going to put the end covers on and tighten it all up well, what will happen if you take off the gaskets 
you could adjust the um, the play in the shaft, the floats in the shaft. You see, what's different about these gearboxes is this. These are sort of allowed to float a little bit because the bearings will move. Um, you know, there's no shims in it, and that's what I'm trying to say. Because they're roller bearings or they're, they're parallel bearings. Whereas if you go onto a, a gearbox, this, this is out of an R380, you can see they're on taper roller bearings. When they're on taper roller bearings, you have to put a bit of preload on the, bear, on the shaft and you have to calculate that. We're going to do an R380 one day because that seems a really popular rebuild. But when you've got taper roller bearings in a gearbox, you've got to put preload. If you don't, if, if the load is too loose, the shaft will drop. It'll be noisy as a bugger. You know, it'll be, be really noisy. And if you go the other way, you put too much preload on, you tighten it up too much, what you'll find is then it, it'll, be, it'll, be get, it'll run hot. So you don't want that because the bearings are working super hard. So putting the preload on is quite important. So what I'm trying to get at is this if the gearbox was designed to have gaskets, put the gaskets back. And this is why I'm, I'm sort of perturbed about this gearbox job because they've gone to all the trouble of putting a shaft in, they've changed a few bearings, they've probably changed the synchro rings, but they didn't go to the extra mile per paying another ten dollars for a set of gaskets it's crazy it doesn't make sense they're very easy to get the silicone out and <laughs> put silicone everywhere and it's job done so um yeah gaskets are there and gaskets are there for a reason um on the older three r3 uh, not the lt230 transmissions there was no gaskets on the early ones there were so if you take gaskets off put gaskets back on again because the tolerances and clearances were designed for gaskets. I hope I made that clear. I hope you could understand that because even I get lost sometimes. So I'm going to start to uh, do a final clean of all the parts. So I've inspected just about everything. I can't think of anything else more. Um, so we've, we've, you can apply these techniques to just about engines, gearboxes, axles and things like this. Just look and inspect everything, because if, if it looks wrong, then it is wrong, you know. Uh, and, and sometimes you look at gears, and you'll find the really sharp points on there. Well, the gear's worn out, but usually gears have a little bit of a, a flat on the top, so there's a bit of a telltale giveaway, uh, if, it's, if it's worn or not. Well, another thing I was going to say was, obviously, this parts manual, this uh, workshop manual that we've got over here. Well, it turned out to be, <laughs> it turned out to be a complete waste of time. So, if you ever get stuck, look, look. That, well, the workshop manual was a waste of time. But if you ever get stuck and you want to really know how to put things together in order, because they are look, they, they do look a bit of a nightmare to a novice. If you get hold of the, the uh, parts manual, it will show you a breakdown, piece by piece, how these things go together in logical order. You see? So sometimes you don't need a workshop manual, but you can work it out logically. So a, a parts manual can be quite good as well. One last thing before I go, because I've got, <laughs> I've got an awful lot of things to do today because it's Friday. But... Um, I mentioned in, a, in the beginning of the, the, the last video I did about making a stand to put this into the vice, you know, this, this gearbox into the vice. And uh, as I was reading up about this a little bit more last night, I realised that that is kind of mission critical for the simple reason that when we put these shafts together and these little... Um, what do we say? What pins? We see these little pins here. They go through there. Now, there's no way that you could put this gearbox together on its side because those pins are just going to drop straight through. So that was the idea why they wanted it on a vice, so that when you installed this particular shaft back in, the pin's not going to drop out. So I'm going to make that this morning. I'm going to sort of do that this morning. 
Um, it's a shame really because I've only got one gearbox and it's an awful lot of work to make one stand but well sometimes you have to do it. Um, so that's it. I mean we're, we're going to clean everything up and we're going to lay it out and we put it back together and in the next video I will try and explain to you how this gearbox works. Um, you know how, how the shafts work a lot of people have done uh, videos on Land Rover gearboxes and things like this uh, but I haven't seen all that much information on Santana gearboxes lots and lots on R380s but not so much on the other thing so that will do for now oh look at this I'll tell you something this is an interesting one look um, buying second hand gearboxes uh, I bought this second hand gearbox and the uh, guy said it was shifting really really nice there was no problems with it etc etc but when I actually stripped it down it was really rusty I, I can't use those gears unfortunately they're pitted and once, they go, once a gear gets pitted so this is one thing you've got to look for in all your gears even though there, there might be a you, you know you sometimes can get away with one or two but when it's like three quarters of the way around, it's all pitted. You're you're breaking through the hardness of the gear, so that means that the gear is not going to last last very long because they do an awful awful lot of work. So there's one thing to look for. And I've just spotted something here. I hope you can see. This is your third gear. This is your second gear, and this is a common common problem with Land Rovers. When I was mentioning earlier about the synchro ring being so close, look how close that synchro ring is to that gear. This is, this is, this is a second gear. So when this comes down to select, like, like that, what happens is, instead of that synchro ring breaking the, the drive, so when you're driving around, uh, when the, the, the drive's going through the gearbox, that's got to link like this to the shaft and that's why it will grind because it's not slowing down that that synchro ring there is doing absolutely nothing so a lot of work to just to replace a little ring because the, the gear if the gear wasn't uh, pitted we could just replace those cones and away you go because they are sort of sacrificial so so there's a few things to look for in gearboxes I hope you enjoyed that, and uh, if you did, or if you could understand it, uh, <laughs> give us a thumbs up, because the next section is going to be to put it back together. Alright, talk to you later.